in the final months of Hitler's Third Reich, at a remote airfield deep inside Nazi Germany, a top-secret jet fighter makes its first flight. This is the Horton 229, a Nazi weapon that might have changed the very outcome of the war. The Horton 229 had to be the most exotic piece of machinery in Germany at that time. But was it truly stealth? It has been one of the last great mysteries of World War II. Now, more than 60 years after it took to the skies, one, two, three. An elite team of aeronautical engineers and stealth experts. Yeah, we lost it. It's over. Reconstruct one of the Third Reich's most incredible secrets. It's great. It's in. Never moved a German stealth fighter before. They'll put the Nazi flying wing to the test to unlock the mystery of Hitler's stealth fighter. Germany in a desperate search. Intelligence reports suggest Hitler's Third Reich has a secret weapon that could change the outcome of the war. On April 14, 1945, the U.S. Third Army discovers a top secret facility hidden in the woods 100 miles northeast of Frankfurt. Inside, they find one of Nazi Germany's most advanced weapons, made almost entirely of wood. The soldiers must have been stunned when those doors opened up, and for the first time, they see this aircraft with its unearthly shape, something that no one had ever seen before, a jet engine-powered wooden aircraft. It would have been impossible for them to clearly understand the magnitude or even the importance of what they had discovered. In July 1945, the Horton 229 and other advanced Nazi aircraft are shipped back to the United States under the code name Operation Seahorse. The Batwing fighter is reassembled, but its flying and stealth capabilities are never tested. six decades, the only surviving Horton 229 has remained hidden in the shadows and away from prying eyes. Generations ahead of its time, the coveted Nazi war prize remains under tight security, along with other U.S. artifacts, here inside a government warehouse outside of Washington, D.C. Sixty-four years after the Horton 229 took to the skies, the debate about its stealth capability is about to be settled. Wow. It's amazing that the uh, Germans were that far along in World War II. It's amazing that of the technology that existed during the time frame, that they could come up with this type of a vehicle. Stealth expert and aircraft designer Tom Dobrenz will lead a team from the aerospace company Northrop Grumman in building a full-scale replica of the Horton 229. Once complete, they'll then test its stealth ability against World War II Allied radar. After the Battle of Britain, Goring come out and says, we need to find new flying machines. What we got now is ineffective. It wasn't ineffective. You know, they had some, some good flying machines. It was the radar that destroyed them. Most of what is known about the 229 was gathered by David Myra during his meetings with the plane's designers, Walter and Reimar Horton, before they died in the 1990s. Okay, Aldo, uh, diameter of the exhaust liner. The team has been given a few precious hours to examine and take measurements of the original German jet, a plane constructed almost entirely of wood. Skin thick 
thickness, three quarters of an inch. The layers of veneer suggest the plywood may have prohibited the radar from penetrating the skin. Was it truly something that they were trying to defeat a radar system? And that's going to be something we're going to try to find out. To solve the mystery, they'll first test the plywood skin. This will help us determine whether energy was being, is being absorbed or reflected or maybe shielding the inside of the vehicle itself from, uh, from energy. They'll use a pair of radar emitting probes to focus electromagnetic energy against the plywood skin to see if it absorbs radar. Uh, it seems like uh, the surface itself isn't conductive, but uh, it may be absorbing the uh, signal. So there's, there's a good possibility that this could have been built as of anything, maybe not even absorbing, but just possibly shielding. The test confirms the wood improved the fighter's detection range, but it's not the only stealth feature on the Horton aircraft. It's got buried engines in the, in the fuselage. All the surfaces are blended. Um, you've got the carbon in the skin. You've got all these things. And then to say, you know, were they thinking about radar? Well, everything points to that. This is the modern shape of stealth, the Northrop Grumman B-2 bomber. This expansive flying wing embodies both engineering elegance and all aspect stealth. Although it spans more than 170 feet, its radar cross-section, the amount of electromagnetic energy it reflects back to the radar, is smaller than that of an eagle. To reduce its signature, stealth aircraft like the B-2 rely on two critical factors, materials that absorb this energy, and more importantly, a shape that prevents it from returning to the radar. Stealth technology doesn't make an aircraft invisible, but what it can do is dramatically reduce the detection range, making it much more difficult to defend against using fighters and anti-aircraft weapons. Modern stealth aircraft were developed by aerospace companies like Northrop Grumman in secret facilities starting in the 1970s. A lot of the things that we've been doing over the years, you know, is kept in a cloak of secrecy. Most of the time, the things I work at Northrop are programs that I'm not allowed to talk about. Much of that top secret work happens here at the company's advanced design and manufacturing facility in the Los Angeles suburb of El Segundo. It's also where they'll build the Horton 229 over the next three months. While it won't be designed to fly, like the original, it will be a full-scale replica constructed around a center body flanked by a pair of outer wing panels. Uh, right now, we're building the rotator, and we're... Tim Knott's model shop team begins assembling the center body from blueprints reproduced from the Horton Brothers' original drawings. Okay, let's stick it together. Like the original Horton fighter, they'll use glue and nails to fasten the parts. While the shape of the replica is critical to its radar cross-section, or RCS testing, so are the materials. Most of it is wood, and there's a few parts that are going to be made out of fiberglass. But the only metal parts are the, uh, the uh, rotator and the lifting points. Gus Kindweiler and Tim Knott have spent their careers working on Northrop's most advanced stealth programs. And they're not all the They'll same. assemble the model's center body around a metal rotator. The majority of RCS models built by Northrop Grumman are classified. Most are destroyed after stealth testing is complete. The rotator is the only part that is reused. This rotator box was used on a different program, uh, another classified program. I really can't tell you what it is, but it's seen its fair share of action. When complete, the rotator will be used to attach the model to a pole five stories above the ground. They'll then direct radar at the fighter to determine its stealth. The idea to build the original 229 
a German aircraft virtually undetectable to Allied radar, was born in the aftermath of one of the most pivotal battles of World War II. In preparation for Hitler's planned invasion of Great Britain, in the summer of 1940, Hermann Göring unleashes the Luftwaffe with orders to destroy the Royal Air Force. But the British have a secret weapon. What gave the British the defensive edge they needed was radar. This was a new technology that provided accurate range, altitude, and the numbers of German aircraft as they approached across the English Channel. Britain's chain home network of radar stations proves critical in directing RAF fighters who cut down the German invaders. That was the one technology that completely alleviated the advantage the Germans had with their overwhelming number of aircraft. The Battle of Britain proved to be the pivotal point in the air war and radar was the key. In an effort to recapture Luftwaffe's supremacy, Goring envisions a new fighter employing the latest in state-of-the-art German technology. Officially, the concept was known as a 3 by 1000 that is, a fighter that could fly 1,000 kilometers an hour over a 1,000 kilometer distance and deliver a 1,000 kilogram bomb on target. It was pushing the limit of any known aviation technology of the day. As members of the Hitler Youth, Reimar and Walter Horton became consumed with the idea of creating an aircraft that flew with the elegant efficiency of birds. In the early 1930s, the self-taught aircraft designers began building and piloting a series of tailless wooden gliders. To meet Goring's requirements, the brothers began modifying their flying wing around a recent innovation, the jet engine. If their concept worked, it promised to leave the Allies defenseless. Walter and Reimer's brother Wolfram was, was killed in the Battle of Britain as Wolfram was laying mines along the French coast in Heinkel 111. Walter was still burned with revenge for losing all his friends in the Battle of Britain, so he wanted to go back to England to attack the British chain home radar network. The Horton 229 was the brainchild of Walter, and it was generations ahead of any other aircraft developed in the world. Of the proposals reviewed by Goring for his new fighter, only one aircraft met his requirements. It was a radical design submitted by two brothers he'd never heard of. The flying wing was a radical concept to everyone, including Goring. And the idea that it was made out of wood just added to his skepticism. Walter's so consumed with the passion for this plane that he sort of pulls Goring into the whole idea saying we can do it we can build this from wood with jet engines we can make it fly a thousand kilometers an hour we can give it a thousand kilometer range we can deliver the payloads you need and Goring just said I I'm just astounded by this machine and the shape he says no tail no elevator Walter said it's going to be so maneuverable against allied fighters allied bombers it's going to sweep the skies clean for you so Goring is so taken by Walter's vision that he buys in completely to a flying wing. Goring said, go do this, build it for me and make it fly. The Hortons left the meeting with Goring knowing that they had won the contract to build a three times 1,000 flying machine and now they felt that they had been vindicated. More than a half century later, the team at Northrop Grumman begins constructing the wings for their Horton 229. This is going to be a big model, over 50 feet wingspan, and we're going to need a lot of wood to build this model. We're trying to build it similar to what they built it back in World War II. Even though it's only a model, they must ensure its shape and the materials used in its construction mimic the original aircraft for the radar testing to be valid. Just painting the back of the wings is enough to represent the tanks? Yeah, because actually at the frequencies and the wavelengths that these radars worked at, they were very long. And this was an aluminum metallic tank. And I think if we paint it with some conductive materials, it'll represent part of the structure of that tank to the radar. We're actually going to be painting and